Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you were here in the last class that we had? This is a whole stay over group or one? Okay, so there's a whole new group from the last class. Okay. The what? You say the usual? There, no, there were three or four that were oh. in the last. Okay. Have a, um, so I'm Jenny McCall, and this is Kevin. And I'm Kevin. A little bit about me. We joined forces about five years ago. Before we got together, I was studying luxury. Um, and so I was finding myself needing help a lot and bringing in agents like you guys to help me. And I thought, what am I? I was giving away half my commission to agents to help me, but they weren't sharing back. And so I decided to join a team where we could work together. And so I have five kids. Um, three bio and two adopted out of the foster care system. In two days, I will officially be a court appointed special advocate for uh, foster and adoptive children. And I love animals, I love children, I um, love the outdoors and exercise, and I love real estate. So that's why I am here and I'm excited to get to know you guys better. And I'm Kevin Craig, and she explained a little bit about why we kind of come as a pair, why we're doing this together. We've been working together for a while and have fun with a small team of about 15 of us total or so. And uh, some of what we're going to present is stuff that we just filled our own team in on with mm -hmm. our with team meeting here a couple of weeks ago, and it went over really, really well about just what's happening in the industry and stuff. So I thought we'll come up here and share it with even more folks. You guys will be all updated on what's going on, and more importantly, kind of like how to talk about it. Um, I've been in real estate since 2004. I had a previous career to that, which was in the corporate world, and when I got out of that, decided I wanted to do something completely different, which this is completely different. And uh, there's a whole other long story that goes behind that, but since we started three minutes behind, we're gonna skip all that part. So, and you wanna find out who all is in the room. Then. Well, I just want, well, really, I just wanted to, um, well, first, he never tells people this, but I think it's one of the most fascinating things about him. He's a certified interrogator, and he worked with the FBI at UPS to catch bad guys. And so a lot of his clients tell me, you don't probably even know this, but they say they hire him because he is the best negotiator that they could ever find. And so, yeah, that's the mm, master well, told me that. Know. Yeah, you didn't know. So I think that's kind of a little piece of information that's fascinating. So, But we wanted to know why you're here to make sure that we go over everything that you want to get out of being here for this hour. We're telling you up front that, no, we're not going to talk about that, so you're not expecting it. Yeah. Does anybody have, other than knowing what's going on in 2020 or what's predicted to go on in 2020, does anybody have a hope for hearing something special? What do you think about the stock market? Stock market. Are we going to talk about the stock market? We're, we'll talk about the stock market. Okay. okay. It'll be in there. Oh, and I'm reading a book on the stock market right now, too. I'll have to look it up. And I'll share it with you after class. The stock market. What else? What's going on with the, or why we're having the low inventory issues that we're having? Ooh, okay, perfect. Uh, yep, we might, we're talk about and that. we might hit that more. Um, we just found out we're running the mastermind today. And so, because of that, we're probably going to hit that hit more on that in the mastermind. Okay. But we'll see if we have maybe a little bit. Again. Hit, yeah, yeah. If you're not coming to the mastermind, then we'll do a little bit. I'll be there. Because awesome. we do have some stuff about the low inventory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So that's affecting all of us. Yeah. Anything else? else? Stock market, inventory. What else is happening out there? What are you seeing? All right. Then we'll get rolling. Then let's tell let's get folks what, what we've shared with all of all of our game. I don't, I don't think I have to walk over here, but I'm going to do this anyway. So we get tons and tons of questions, not only from our agents, but from our clients as well, wanting to know what's happening. And everybody's dying to have the crystal ball that will tell them what's going to happen in the future. Of course, we don't have a crystal ball to know, but we have a whole lot of indicators. And it's important that our clients know what's going on, because as you're probably all hearing, in the media, it's a mixed bag, and it just depends on who you listen to in the media as to what story you're getting. And these are all some of the fears that people are asking about. Um, we have sellers that are saying, I'm just going to wait to sell um, and see what's going to end up happening with the market. We have buyers waiting to buy because they want to see what's going to be happening in the market. We have some people in a panic to sell because they think that we're going to have a, uh, another dip like what we did before back in 2008, and everything's going to go south. So there's a whole lot of confusion, 
And there's a lot of people that are really concerned about recession, which kind of ties back in, I guess, to your question about the stock market. We'll talk more specifically about the stock market. But how many of you are hearing a lot of recession questions? And are we going to have another recession? You know, like, just show of hands, yeah. So that's a really good question, but there's a better question is like, well, what is a recession? Because if you are around 30 years old and you've been born somewhere around 1989, I'm thinking just general demographics for a group like this, this probably applies to most folks. You've already been through five recessions yourself. Um, but you only remember one. You just remember this one right here. This was the real, the real biggie. But you can see all these recessions that we've had. Here's the Great Depression. This is the end of, this is World War II right here. But then about every five years we have a recession and all a recession is is really just a, a release of pressure from our economy. So it's just like anything else, whatever goes up has to come down a little bit, usually eases up just a, just a hair and then goes goes back up and it keeps, keeps climbing. And when you look at the up and down cycle, you can see that about every five years this happens. And so, yeah, we're gonna have another recession. But are we gonna have another recession like we had in 2008? No, probably not going to be due for one of those for a long, long time, if we ever have one again in our lifetime. But our clients don't know that because they're hearing a lot of news about this whole recession thing and have to understand that recessions are normal. We, we have that. Everybody wants to see things go up, but then at the same time, things need to ease off just a little bit too, or else we have problems like no inventory, those, those kind of things. People hanging on to their house because it's going up in value so much they decide they're not going to sell, they're just going to hunker down and watch the values go up. Well, at what point does some of the pressure get let off on that? And so sometimes we look forward to a recession. You either have a buyer's market or a seller's market, and if you're working with buyers in a seller's market, it sucks. If you're working with sellers in a buyer's market, it sucks. So right now, if you're working with buyers, it sucks, especially if they're coming here and talking about trying to find something affordable or <laughs> just trying to find something. So yeah, we don't need to be worried about a recession because we're going to have another recession. We need to have another recession, but it's not going to affect us like we, we had in 2008. And I'll explain a little bit about why. So if you look at, these are unemployment numbers, and you don't have to focus on the numbers as much as like where the numbers are, but in 1969, the lowest unemployment that we had as a country was 3.5%. And look where we're at today, we're 3.6%. So we've never had a recession when we were in full employment. Full employment is normally seen at anything 6% or less. So when Obama was in office, we were supposedly at full employment at 6%. Well, now we're at 3.6%, but we still have people saying, oh, but we might have another crash. We might have another bubble. We might have all this stuff going. Why, why would that happen when everybody's working? That usually happens when people no longer have jobs. There's a whole bunch of layoffs. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market. Yeah, the stock market crashes, but it's like one thing after another <coughs> leads to a steady decline overall. <coughs> People start losing their jobs. Now they can no longer pay for their houses. The market sort of dries up, and then that's when we have problems. But you don't see that happening when we've got full employment. Right now is a, a great, great time. And then we hear about housing trends. And you hear about people talking, the experts talking about what's happening in the United States, what's going on with housing, and how we, we may see a, a, a stall in the housing market nationally. Can we compare the national housing market to the Arizona housing market? I mean, we all want to think that we're special. I'm sure every state thinks that they're special, but there is definitely something special about Arizona. And uh, just to kind of do a, a, a silly little analogy or metaphor, you can't take the average temperature in the United States and have it apply in any way, shape, or form to what happens in Arizona. If you look at the United States on average, the average summer temperature in the US or in America, as they say over in Europe, is 71.7 degrees. Is that our average temperature in the summertime? Heck no. Just like our average temperature in the winter is not 33.2 like the rest of the country. So you can't take what's happening nation nationwide with housing, with economy, with jobs, with anything, and say if it's happening in the nation, it must be happening in Arizona because we really are a completely different animal. Um, those of you that remember a couple weeks ago when uh, Governor Ducey gave the State of the State address, he said that we have 300 people a day that are moving into Arizona right now. Well, we've had 300 people a day moving into Arizona. Um, anytime, and I, we have a kind of a side note. We have an office on Main Street, Old Town, Scottsdale, that gets a lot of like walk-by traffic, and we have our flyers with our properties listed in the in the window. And so those are kind of like uh, uh, you know track people like Moz to light. 
people come up and are looking at things and, and on there it shows what the taxes are and the, and the cost of the homes and everything. And people are usually shocked at our taxes. And if you haven't lived someplace else besides Arizona, then you may not be able to appreciate how reasonable our taxes are. Um, I moved here from Michigan, where I only lived there for a short period of time, but I think we paid about $6,000 a year in Michigan for our property taxes. And when we came out here, we had basically the same price house, same everything house, but it went down to like $2,000 a month we're paying taxes. So as long as your tax base is growing, then taxes don't have to go up. They can remain steady. In some cases, they can actually go down. But in some cases, like on the West Coast and on the East Coast, where the, the uh, taxes are going up sky high, people are finally bailing out and coming here. One of the things that we're concerned about is that there's so many people coming here from each coast, are they going to come here and then end up voting in some of the same issues that raise the taxes on the coast? Because we don't want that to happen to us either. We kind of like things the way they are. We like everybody coming, but just come here and let us kind of keep things the way that we've, we've had them for a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you can't hear anything that happens nationally and apply it to, to Arizona. And if you hear clients that are doing that or you're in conversations where people are telling you what they what they heard on the Bloomberg or whatever, it may not necessarily apply to what's happening in Arizona. And that's a great conversation topic too. So one of the things that Jenny and I teach with like our group is how to be able to get relationships going and be able to talk to people and engage them in conversation and have something to talk about. And you don't have to be an expert at all things in order to have these conversations. But you have to be able to rebut some of the things that are coming out that do not apply to Arizona. Um, as Jenny mentioned before, with the, my past life when I used to do a lot to put people in, in jail and stuff, I, uh, I found out through court hearings and labor panels and all that that if someone presents something in a, in a court situation that is not rebutted by another party, then it stands as fact. So is that makes sense so like if I said in here right now that the sky is green and nobody rebutted it then as far as the records went for what conversation took place in here today it goes down as the, the sky was green if clients say something about our economy or about Arizona about our market and it doesn't apply and you don't rebut it or give them the true story then in their mind it stands as fact and you just missed an opportunity to have some dialogue with somebody and most of the dialogue we have with people at our office are all people who are just curious about our area. They want to know what's going on. And the big things the agents want to know is, but how do we have these conversations with people? Um, there's a lot of different groups that will come in and talk about what's happening in the economy, what's going on with the Cronford report, what's happening with Arizona news. But some of that is so kind of like bogged down. And we just want to give you some of the highlights of how to have these simple conversations and explain these things in an easy to understand manner. Here's something else. And were you going to talk about market confidence? Because this kind of goes with what you'd asked about the stock market too. No, no. Market confidence, okay. So there's two different things that we tend to talk about. There, you hear about market confidence and consumer confidence. And everybody wants to put those together as being the same thing, and they're not the same thing. As you can see in this, in this chart, this is the S&P 500. This is basically the stock market over time since 2007. Shows where the market has gone. And the blue was from a University of Michigan study where they checked on consumer confidence to see how consumer confidence matches up with the market confidence. And just because they discover uh, another 500 cases of the coronavirus in China, and all of a sudden our stock market dropped yesterday in the United States because of it, does not mean that it affected any of the consumer confidence here on being able to buy a house completely separate, but everybody wants to always put those together. Say, well, if the stock market goes down and it's shown that there's no confidence that people are going to stop buying. Not necessarily, because you can look at the trends here and see, like, right now we've got the stock market pretty high, and then and this was in 2017, the consumer confidence wasn't very high, and right now, most recently, they said our consumer confidence is almost at an all-time high. So people were out there buying like crazy. The problem is there's not a lot to buy. That's, that's one of our biggest handicaps right now. And everybody wants to know about a housing bubble. What's going to happen with the, with the housing bubble? And, and honestly, I think most of us are getting asked this almost on a daily basis from different clients or even people just in conversation. You know, what's going to happen with this? Are we, are we going to end up popping? And I gotta explain that you know, a housing bubble is so much tied to one of those first slides that I talked about when it comes to what's, what's really happening out there and, and the, um, the confidence that the consumers are displaying. And there's not gonna be a bubble when we've got full employment and we don't have enough houses to go around. The reason why we had the big crash in 2008 is we had 
bad loans that were out there. The, the banks were giving money to people to buy homes that really couldn't afford the homes. A lot of them were adjustable rate mortgages, so when the rates adjusted, now they could no longer afford the payment. They really didn't have the income that they said they had, so they had to walk away from the house, which meant the banks were taking houses back when people were walking away from them, and then the banks aren't in the business to hold on to houses, so they were selling them off to investors at pennies on the dollar. And when that happens, the whole housing market comes down. But that happened because of bad loans. Here in Arizona, we were doubly affected because not only were there bad loans, but the builders came in and built like crazy during 2004, 2005, because they kept saying, the people are coming, the people are coming. So they're building houses faster than people were getting to Arizona. And when everything came to a screeching halt, we had inventory sitting there that wasn't being used, and the whole thing kind of collapsed like a big vacuum. That's not the case. That's not what's going on right now today. It's completely different. We have one comment on that. Oh uh, well, especially with new, you know, new builds. Mm -hmm. Now I, I came from a, I came from a, the Columbus, Ohio market. I was an appraiser there, and and you know we've seen those. You know you can have this three bedroom home, you know that's you know eighteen hundred square feet or whatever, and you're and you're only paying like five hundred dollars a month for this home mm -hmm. on a three one arm, and then all of a sudden when they you know when the rates rise and they're not eligible for the you know, for the uh, refire or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, did everything hit the fan. Mm -hmm. Those were risky. The, the good thing about an adjustable rate mortgage is early on in the mortgage, the payments are very, very reasonable. So people buy those kind of loans thinking that their income is going to catch up. And that's always a dangerous thing, thinking like, well, I'm getting in on a break with a really low rate right now, but when it adjusts, I just have to make sure I'm making more money in my job. Well, that's great as long as the economy doesn't go bad at the same time and people start losing jobs. And then when they adjust, they can also adjust down. So I did have an adjustable rate mortgage at, at one time when the rates were coming down. That's a great time to have an adjustable rate mortgage. My payment kept getting less and less and less. But on the flip side, when the rates start going back up, and right now they're super, super low, like 3.7, so there's really no place for the rates to go except up right now. This would not be a very wise time to get an adjustable rate mortgage because the odds that they would go down from 3.7 are ridiculous. Chances are they're gonna be going up. So why would you wanna buy a mortgage where you know your rate was gonna continually going up? So yeah, really, really good point. And the other thing that we don't have now besides, there's not a lot of adjustable rate mortgages that are being used out there right now because conventional and FHA and all that are so low. But the other problem that we had was that, um, oh, I just lost my whole train of thought where I was going with the adjustable rates. Uh, stated income. Stated income. Thank you. That's exactly what I said. The other thing was you, you didn't even have to really prove how much money you made. I did a stated income loan for a spec house I was building one time. And uh, this was back in like 2003, I think. And uh, I went and sat down the bank and they said, here, fill all this information out, put down how much money you make and all this. And I started filling it all out. And the guy looked at it, goes back and goes, no, you're going to do this because it's not going to be a primary residence. You need to show that you make more money. So put a bigger number in there. I went, I didn't put a bigger number than us, how much money I make. And he goes, no, 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 nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna check. They're not gonna verify anything. Just, just, put a, just put a bigger number in there because your debt to income ratio has to be higher. So I crossed it out, I wrote a bigger number in there. Well, that was going on across the country. And it was happening a lot here because there were so many people moving here, stated income loans, you don't even have to really have a job. You can just say you have a job. And then you get these adjustable rate mortgages to make it nice and cheap. And once they adjust and once the the facts come to light that you really don't have money or the job, then you lose the house. And that's where we all got caught in that. And the neg am, do you guys remember the negative amortization loans? Oh my God, where your balance went up every month. <laughs> so, remember that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that one too. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, just banking on that market's going up, market's going up, so just do a neg am loan. Was, so, yeah. this kind of ties in with some of your inventory question because this all ties it's all part of the big picture you can't take really any one part of this and say this is what's happening in the market it's all these little factors all put together but these are the main factors and the way that we're explaining them here is kind of like on, on our level the way we understand them so I'm not talking like an economist because I'm not an economist I'm talking like a real estate guy and this is the way I, I understand stuff but just yesterday, there was an article that came out in the East Valley Tribune, and, I, and I, I recognize that we're in Scottsdale right now and not Gilbert or Chandler. However, this sort of applies to most of the valley. And the article in the East Valley Tribune was saying that we're in trouble because there's just not enough housing going around right now. 
and that normally, and this is what Jenny and I always tell, tell our agents, we tell our clients, is like, here's the normal trend. We get into the fourth quarter and December starts getting really busy and we have a lot of people that are doing stuff and then the holidays come around and all of a sudden they, it kind of backs off a little bit. And then what usually happens at the first part of the year? We have a whole bunch of new inventory come on because everybody's just waiting to put their house on after they've taken their Christmas decorations down and they don't have people staying with them anymore. So the first year, normally, boom, there's a whole bunch of new listings that come on the market. Because so many new listings come on the market, people that have already been on the market are usually forced now to make price reductions. So usually January has got our highest number of new listings on the market and it's got our highest number of price reductions because people that have been told out trying to get top dollar are now forced to make a reduction because other homes came on the market. That's what happens year after year after year until this year. Right now, we're down 15% over last year of how many new homes came on the market the first part of the, of the month. And it goes right into what the article says. So I read the article and the article um, stated numbers and quoted certain statistics from the Cromford report. So I went back in through MLS and I reran all those that information just to make sure I understood how the Cromford report got it. And I pulled up some of the same zip codes that they pulled up, which is this is a Gilbert zip code that's real popular, 85296. Um, since the beginning of the year, 13 new listings. That's it, 13. 85224 and 85225, which are down just kind of around the Chandler and Wall area, another real popular area. There's usually a whole lot of inventory that comes on. There's only 11 and 224 and 13 that came on at 85225. So we have a real, real problem with new inventory coming on because there hasn't been a whole bunch of new inventory. What's happened with the prices? They haven't had to have a bunch of price reductions because they're not competing with that many people. So the prices are staying right up. So this whole thing kind of like just all ties together. You see how this is all tying in and now we've got people who want to buy homes but they either don't have any inventory to choose from or they don't have anything that they can afford. And then I got thinking, well, I wonder what some of the pricing is. Like, does anybody know what the average price of a home is in the Phoenix metro area? When they, they usually lump us all into just one big metro area and say this is what the average price of a home is. Does anybody know what the latest like number is? 260 or something. 260, okay. Yeah, that, I think that's a pretty accurate number. Somewhere between 260, 275, somewhere in there, depending on what article you're reading. What about if I put it a little bit differently and said, what would be the average home price of homes that are available on the market, like right now, let's just say in Scottsdale. So if you were working with a, a set of buyers that came out and said, we want to go find homes, I'm not talking about what just sold. I'm not talking about what's pending. I'm talking about what's available right now what do you think the average price home is in Scottsdale? Over 550. Over 550, yes. okay. Pretty pretty high, pretty high numbers, you think? Okay, so here's the controversial part of that. It's like, well, there are lower priced homes out there than, than the average. Obviously, the average is right in the middle. But part of the problem is some of the more expensive homes have been sitting around the market for a long time, and we know that some of the lower priced homes go really, really fast, right? Like somebody put something on at a reasonable price and there's multiple offers and it's gone within days. I put a house on the market yesterday and five minutes later I had my first showing set up. There are people that are just waiting to pounce on stuff. So when you say the average price of what's available and people come in and say, I want to live in this area and I've got this much money that I'm, that I'm qualified for, please show me something in this. Sometimes it's realistic and sometimes it's not. This shock that I'm about to show you shocked me so bad that I went back again the next day after I put the slide together and re-ran all my numbers because I got thinking, this can't be right. This can't be right. But this is right. Look at this. Gilbert, average. What's on the market? 582. The Scottsdale question, 1.7. That's the average of what's available. Now, these are single-family homes. Yeah, you can find condos that are, that are lower priced. But the problem is you get these people that say, well, we're looking for an updated four bedroom, three bath with a pool, and we're pre-approved to 300,000. Let's go look. And you're going, well, crap, where are we going to look? Now, you can see that there's some areas like over in the West Valley, you've got uh, Glendale, Goodyear, and Avondale. They're all below 400,000. Avondale's below 300,000. But that's basically where you have to go. Uh, you notice also I don't have Phoenix on here. And the reason I didn't put Phoenix on here is because that is such a huge city that I'd almost have to break it up into a whole bunch of different zip codes. Because am I talking about South Phoenix down along Baseline? Or am I talking about Phoenix like Arcadia, 85018? It's like the highest price per square foot in the valley. You can't lump those all together in one area. 
So people that are coming in right now that are looking to find something affordable, this is the problem that we're running into right now. And this is one of the reasons why we got really difficult time trying to find properties for, for buyers. Um, people think in other parts of the country because they qualify to 300,000, that that's, that's pretty good money. And when I was young and buying houses like 300,000, oh my gosh, I think my, my first house was 64,000. So I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, 300,000 ought to buy you anything you want. Well, not, unfortunately not the Phoenix metro area. And then with the builders that are out there trying to build right now, here's the problem that the new builds are having. Because the land they're buying has gone up in value, and this is, again, this is coming from me. This is not Kevin the economist, this is Kevin the real estate guy. So you say that a, a piece of property, a piece of land or a residential lot or whatever should be about 25, 30% of the total value of the house, right? And that kind of what appraisers usually say, 25, 30%. So you start looking at, well, how much are the builders buying land for? And then they take the cost of all the infrastructure and all that, and then look at what kind of house they're going to have to put on that lot. And in order to make a profit based on all the expenses and now the cost of the infrastructure for the land, we don't have any affordable housing anymore. You can't buy or can't build a $200,000 house in Arizona and make any money off of it. So that's why we're having prices that are starting in the 400,000, starting in the 500,000. And again, that's to start, that strips down, strip down mm -hmm. pretty base to be able to do that. And then as I was putting this together, I was thinking this, this is for real. But last year, this is an exact quote. I had a client uh, that was moving here from out of state. And they said, the last time I was here, I saw some houses on Camel Hill or something like that. We like to look in that area, but we're qualified at the $275,000. <laughs> I said, are you talking about Camelback Mountain? Yeah, that's it, Camelback Mountain. We like to live there where those houses were on Camelback Mountain. Well, if we go back to Paradise Valley, <laughs> or, how do I go seven. back? We'll just say yeah. three million. Three million. And I try to explain to people that are asking about Paradise Valley that you might be able to find a $2 million house so you can tear it down and build a $3 million house, but you're not gonna be able to go in there and get anything for 275,000. But again, people are listening to what's happening in the national news. And they're saying, oh, this is gonna be an affordable year. We're gonna, everything's gonna kind of maintain status quo. We're not gonna see a big run up in values. This would be the time to buy something cheap here. There's nothing cheap here anymore. And the other problem we're having is with labor. With this getting people to be able to build the houses. Back in the day in 2003 and four and five when our market was going crazy and there were a lot of investors out there and we had housing or builders that were coming in and building like crazy. They had all kinds of, of subs and, and labor uh, workers that were building the homes. And then when our market crashed, they all left and went to other places to be able to make a living. And a lot of them went and found other jobs. And now that we've picked back up, trying to get people to come back here again and work again, maybe for a short period of time, because who knows how long we're gonna be we're gonna be building like this is very difficult for them. So now they're trying to bring in workers from other countries to come in and be able to work some of the, the manual labor to, to build homes. And we had somebody, well, one of our, our commercial guy, Aaron Dutcher, was in our meeting yesterday and he said, it's amazing now at job sites to hear all the different languages that are being spoken. Well, because they're builder. Built, so yeah. PV Tour had a builder well, panel builders, the other yeah. day and Calvis White was saying, I can't believe all the languages I'm hearing on the job sites because, and, and he will pay people. He's like, it's not a problem for me to pay people, but people don't want to work here. Like we just don't have labor workers. We have people who want to sit at desks and dress up and so we just don't have enough labor workers so they're going to other countries and not just across our border but across the ocean <laughs> and we don't just have that problem with the housing market that's in a lot of other industries here too really? just, i agree with what you're saying here when you look into the details i'm i drove down from prescott and uh sun city anthem there's a big billboard that says um, new construction 190,000. Boy, that sounds pretty good. I, mm -hmm. I just don't believe it. And You'll it's have a new to stop billboard. in and let us know. A new yeah. billboard, Sun City, <laughs> <Modular> 190,000. <laughs> Is that a lot? I don't know. Yeah, it's you'll a, have to stop in and like post on the mastermind <laughs> and let us know because. I mean, that. it's like a disservice at that. Idea. Well, and the further out you go, the greater the chance is that you're going to be able to find something a little yeah. bit more affordable. I mean, if you want to go down to Marana and past Casa Grande and, you can, and way out to Buckeye and, and out there towards Tonopah, 
yeah, you can find stuff that's really more affordable, but most people say, no, I want to be within 15 minute commute to the airport or ASU, or I've got to be by downtown. I don't want to be way far out, but I want to be somewhere close to the epicenter of, of the Phoenix metro area, and I want it to be a newer build, and I need it to be affordable. It's like, that just isn't going to happen. That's like saying I want beachfront property in Colorado. It's like it just it doesn't exist. <laughs> they say list their house. You guys sell their house down here for one million, two million. Ship them up to tell them to come to Prescott and retire, and we'll get them in a new built house for three fifty. That's great. That's awesome. But five years ago, what was a new built house in Prescott? Two sixty. So you guys are climbing like crazy mm -hmm. too. We're climbing too. But there are there are solutions and there are answers. And you guys, I mean, you, that's what you—that's your job to work on. Yeah, yeah. And our job is not to change all this. We're not yeah. going to change all this. We yeah. just have to be able to explain this yeah. because we get people here that have a very false understanding of what the market is like in Arizona and what they qualify for, what they can buy, what they can see. Um, it's a whole completely different different animal. So this is just mainly so you guys can talk through and explain what's what's really going on. Um, I, I tell in, in another class that I've taught before, I would say people will ask us a lot, like, so what's going on in the real estate market? And they don't necessarily want to know what's going on in the real estate market. They're trying to have a real estate conversation with you. They just don't know what else to ask because they don't have the expertise that you have. This is all the kind of stuff that you can share with them that's more of like layman level so that they understand it and then they'll still come back to you as the, the value resource because you're the one that presented it to them in an easy to understand way. If you sit and you try to watch it on Fox News or CNN, you're going to get a political skew with, with everything, and it's, it's not going to be a kind of a neutral view, which I think we we're... One more question, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was just thinking, I was wondering if some of the people are hanging on to their houses because even though they can get more money, it's still going to cost so much more yeah. to get any money. Where are they going to go? Yeah, That's my kids have a house, and they want it yeah. <coughs> but... They They've got to go over double their they, price. Yeah, they have to go so high that they're just better off staying. Mm -hmm. you know, it's We're like hearing that a lot. Mm -hmm. People are wondering if that's why. Absolutely. It's the slide. It's the slide on the average active. And I think people are waiting or just staying put. I'm one of them. I really want a bigger backyard. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to double my price to do that, and I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to live for my house or right. work for my house. So I stay. But fortunately, we have with the 300 people a day that are moving to Arizona, there's a lot of opportunities to be able to work with these buyers that are coming from other places where they're not necessarily in the same situation. This is an improvement for them, but there's a very bad misconception as to what they can actually afford and what's really available out here. And we don't want to send them away. We want to be able to find something for them, but we have to paint a really honest picture of what's happening. And when you do find the property that they want, then you know that you, you gotta be pretty aggressive to go to go get it. People still think that, okay, well, it's priced at 325. Let's go in at 275 and see what they say. <laughs> this no. is not the market for that. You're gonna get beat out. And as we all know, a lot of times people have to get their butts kicked and not, not even get a couple of houses before they finally go, holy crap, the, the agent's right. We gotta be more aggressive going in there. But you can tell them ahead of time why they need to be more aggressive. And this is not your agenda. You guys didn't create this. You're not just trying to get them to overspend on a house so you get a bigger commission. You're just explaining to them what's what's really going on in the world right now. And we do have solutions. I know that this is, kind of sounds a little bit gloomy. Um, none of this is gloomy because remember, people live in the payment, not the price. And our interest rates are so low right now. And they live in the floor plan, not the square footage. So it's our job to think of solutions of, of what we can do to help them. Like maybe they don't need 4,000 square feet, maybe they need 3,500 and they could take down a wall or you know something. So there's solutions. And another solution, and we'll talk about this more in the mastermind, is we see a lot of, like he was saying, there's AWCs and UCBs. And remember, per MLS guidelines, those sellers have to allow showings. If they're UCB or AWC, and you, you guys remember this as listing agents, that means you, you're you're still allowing showings. And how many times have you tried to show an AWC and listing says the listing agent says no more showings? Well, then you need to change that to pending because I just got a Zillow lead that wants to see that house and it's showing active, and that's why. So I, um, I believe 39 percent of houses are coming back on the market; they're falling out right now um, due to inspection and appraisals. So it's smart 
to show those houses, the AWCs, UCBs, and get in there and write back up offers. How about appraisals coming in too, or too high, or too, I mean too low? Is yeah. that what falling out? So that's people are listening the, them really high and then the mm -hmm. And down. we're gonna talk a lot about that um, next mastermind. We had our team meeting yesterday and that was like a huge topic for us is, yes, they are not coming in and um, for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about that. Are you going to be here, or do we need to? Okay. So, like, if you're not going to be here, we can still talk about it. So there's yeah. no more than you hearing it twice. But yeah. yes, appraisals are becoming a problem. Yes, the banks aren't going to let what happened last time happen again. Yeah. So just because it's, it almost sounds wrong in one way, but just because the buyer and the seller agree on a number does not mean the bank is willing to loan the money or that, that amount of money. If it was cash, that's yeah. a different story. But if the bank's going to loan it, the bank's going to say, we want to keep a kind of handle on this and not let this get out of control. Because as you saw a few slides ago, it is out of control. I mean, I had no idea that my area where I live was as expensive as it is. Or even some of the areas that I asked Jenny yesterday, like, what do you think the average price is of what's available in Mesa? And she came up with a really, really low number. And it was like five something. It's like, really? That's crazy. It was a three number. It's not that low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, no, no it's bigger. Like, God, but um, but there's a solution to every problem. So I really think right now the solution to this problem is showing those AWCs and UCBs and getting in there because I really think your odds. Um, first of all, if you're a seller and the appraisal doesn't come in and you have a backup offer, what are you going to do? You're going to call that backup offer before you come down. Right? And if you're a buyer and you find a nice remodeled home that you love, but it's under contract and you have some cash, well, you probably value that home a little more than the appraiser does. So I think that we can. It's a great strategy to be looking at those right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, as Jenny said, just kind of automatically write those off and they're only looking at actives to send their client. There's just not enough of those out there. But I can tell you, as a, like from a listing agent's perspective, when I've got an offer on a property, I know that we're not out of the woods yet. We're, it's not done until it's done, right? And there's all kinds of things that can go haywire and throw that thing off. I encourage backup offers all the time. I always want backup offers, and I'm usually surprised that there's not more people putting in backups. They could probably get a smoking deal at some point because the stars and the planets might align just right where the appraisal comes in bad, they can't agree to an inspection type stuff, somebody loses the job or changes their mind, or there's a million different reasons why things could crash, and whoever's first in line with a backup offer just got themselves a great deal on a great house. But we don't usually do that. We eliminate those and just go talk to them about the actors out there. Okay, so kind of changing gears here for a second. Here's, here's another problem with what's happening in the in the world out there today, in the United States anyways, depending on where you get your news will have a big impact on what kind of news you get. So this is not meant to be a political discussion. I'm not trying to get all political. This it is what it is. But there are some news agencies that are extremely uh, conservative, as we all know, and there are some that are cons extremely liberal. And it'd be nice if we could get all of our news like right in the middle. But if I go see what's happening on CNN, then I feel like I need to go look and see what's happening on Fox because I'm going to get two completely conflicting stories and then figure out that the truth is probably someplace more in the in the middle. But this is a study that was done to see who's, who's liberal, who's kind of in the middle, and who's conservative. And you can see that the people that are getting their news from Fox News are getting a whole bunch of this over here. The people at CNN are getting a whole bunch of this down here. I found a site that my wife turned me on to that comes from Great Britain. They have more accurate news about what's happened in the United States, or more neutral news of what's happened than we do here. All you have to do is go find out what Great Britain's saying is going over here, and it's probably a lot more accurate. But you have to find out from your clients or get a feel for them, like, well, where are they getting their information? And on top of all that, we're in a, a, a election year, right? So things are going to get really, really bad. We're going to have, and again, this isn't meant to be political, it just is what it is, but this group over here right now is the, the, the liberal side is no longer in power. The conservatives are in power. So this group here wants everybody to think that we need to make a big change with our president because we're going to hell in a handbasket. This group here is saying that we're going to go to hell in a handbasket if you get rid of the president that we have right now. And so we're going to tell you that everything is fantastic the way it is right now, and we're going to ignore some of the negative news. 
they're ignoring some of the positive news. Like today, we're signing an agreement with Canada and Mexico, a trade agreement that's taking the, the place of, of NAFTA. And it's supposed to be this great thing, going to add all these jobs and all that. But there's not a whole lot of information out there about it right now because they want the current president to get credit for doing something good right now. They would rather focus on the fact that he's going through impeachment hearings. The only reason I'm saying this is your clients are hearing news about what's happening in the economy from one of these areas. And so the question is, if they're not getting it from one of these and they're not getting it from you, or I'm sorry, if they're not getting it from you, they're getting it from one of those, which one are they getting it from? Because all the news is bad, and also it changes by the minute. We have things that are happening just constantly where it used to be there was such a lag between what happened in real time and what got reported that there was all kinds of time to spin it and all that. And now this news is just coming left and right, left and right. And for the most part, most of what we're hearing right now is bad. So we got a lot of clients that are hearing bad news as well. So you got to figure out where they're hearing their news, clear up some of the misconceptions about what's really going on and talk to them about factual stuff. Arizona is completely different. If we were doing this class right now in Louisiana or something, it might be a whole different class because they have a completely different economy in Louisiana than what we have in Arizona. So we can't be the ones that are being quiet about this. We have to be talking to our clients. And agents, for some reason, have a very difficult time talking to their clients and following up with their clients. And I say that because the NAR studies have said we suck at follow-up, we suck at communication with our clients. So right now, if we are not talking to them, it could, it could result in them not doing any business with us because they think that this is a very, very bad time to do business. So we're encouraging at least all of our people to get out there and talk to your clients, give them an update, encourage them to ask questions about, is there gonna be a recession? Is there going to be a bubble? What's happening with the market? What's going on with the inventory? And these are all these little things that you could be sharing to tell them that you know, it's really not the sky is falling type thing. Oh, I already hit that one, didn't I? If they don't hit it from you, where are they gonna get it? And then, something that nobody brought up in here that they wanted to hear about, disruptors. You've heard a lot about disruptors, but sometimes even we don't understand what, what's being disrupted, who are the disruptors. So Jenny, tell us about disruptors. Well, um, so to you guys, tell me, do you believe a dis what is a disruptor? What's being disrupted? Like, what, what is disruption to you? Make a change of how things will been. Change things out. Does it mean that something's going away? Because I've I've had on my team there are some agents that are um, excellent, like ten million dollar producers that are very worried that what we do is going to go away, kind of like travel agents did for a little bit. And um, I'm here to say it's not going away. There's just change happening, and there's somebody coming in trying to change how things are ha how things are going. Um, I think the East Valley, especially the Southeast Valley, have you all know who Kenny Klaus is? He's huge in talking about disruptors, disruptors, disruptors. Well, that's because that's his world. That area where he lives is completely disrupted with open door. Their signs are everywhere. Um, not not quite as much up here right like it's definitely price point driven we have a little video has anybody if i say the word ellen do you guys have a picture of a like cute little blonde woman with big blue eyes <laughs> in your head to yeah. so um statistically uh, americans don't laugh much anymore we don't we don't we it's sad the number one health issue right now is depression and suicide so uh, we wanted to bring a little fun um, to the class today, and I don't know if there's... The only thing we don't know for sure is what's going to happen is sound, so we will, we'll, we'll figure we'll this out. We'll try to play it. it might blow everybody out, and we might not be able to hear it for a second, so bear with me. Oh, we need to watch a commercial first. Yeah. It has to get bad in a minute. Let's just see if we can get it to play. Yeah, that's good. Now that you've said we're all going to laugh, we all want to laugh. I'm on the Wi-Fi. Okay. You're going to have to dance if it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we don't want to do that. See if it all... Okay. I A new time for Geico sequels. Vote and enter to win today. You don't have to do Geico. Every year it shows more and more skin. Uh, 
The internet has made it so easy to find information. Does anyone remember encyclopedias? Yeah? All right. They were these giant books and uh, that everyone read and everybody had them. Who, read, who remembers books? <laughs> How many of you still have encyclopedias? Anybody still have encyclopedias? Yes? All right. Well, I was wondering if they still are, were around, so I Googled it. And um, <laughs> look what I found. I found this. You can buy the whole uh, set of World Book Encyclopedia for just $799. <laughs> or you can get it for 100% off because all of that is on the internet for free. So <laughs> the internet has made it so easy. Everything is, uh, is, everything is just obsolete. You don't need anything anymore. You don't need maps or phone books or human interaction. And I was curious how many young people could function without it. So I set up a challenge. And what I need is a young person right now. And uh, Marley Flandro, I know that there's someone named Marley here. Where's Marley Flandro? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Marley, yes. how old are you? I'm 17 years old. 17 years yes. old. And what do you do? I am a senior at San Clemente High School. Do you yes. work as well, or just you're a senior? Um, I actually have my own business, so. What? Fun. Yeah, I do. <laughs> what kind of business do you have? Um, since I was 11, I've been making and selling little zipper pouches. Like fanny packs? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I actually bought a fanny pack. Yeah, yesterday. they're back in style again. They so are. zipper pouches like for people to carry like makeup and yeah, travel. You can put them in your purses and wow. your bags. Good yeah. for you, a little entrepreneur. Yeah, I love it. It's Good. fun. All right, right Marley. All right, so um, I want I want to show you some things, and I'm going to ask if you know what they are. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you, do you know what this is? Yeah, it's a map. Yes, it is. When's yeah. the last time you used a map? Probably like off-roading with my dad. Oh, you have used it then? I yeah. think he's used your, it. Your dad has. <laughs> so your dad uses a map versus like GPS on his phone and stuff? Back in the olden days, probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> when was that? Like several years ago? Yeah, probably okay. when I was younger. Yeah, when you were younger. Mm -hmm. um, which is not that long ago. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, so here's here's a map, okay? Do you know what this is? It's a yellow book. It has everyone's phone numbers in it, right? It, right? It's a, well, you just read on there, it says yellow book. Yes, it's yellow. Right. But it's, so yes, it's a phone okay. book. Awesome. Yeah. Do you, so you know what that's used for? Have you ever seen one of these? Yeah. <coughs> no, I don't think we have one at my house. No. Okay. But. All right. So here's, this is a, and, and what is this right here? Let me just turn this so the audience sees it as well. What is that? It's a telephone. It is a telephone. You have to spin the dial. Yeah, you spin the dial. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. All right. Here's here's your challenge, okay? okay. I'm going to put a time limit on this. I'm not going to say what it is. I'm keeping it in my head. Okay. All right. And uh, it, it, the time is going to be on a clock. Do you know what a clock is? Yes. I can know. What a clock is. Do you know how to tell time on a clock? Yes. How? From being in school, they don't really. No, know. no, no, not that. <laughs> How, do you, how can you look at a clock and tell the time? Oh, you look at the hand. And the shorter one is the hour and the longer one. Good for you. A lot of young people don't read the time anymore yeah. on clocks. It's crazy. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put some time on the clock. And I want you to, first of all, you're going to fold this back into the position it was. Okay. 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 Then you're going to find a number in here for golden muffler. I want golden you to call muffler. golden muffler and, and call and tell them that you, you need a golden muffler. All right? <laughs> So that's what it is. Fold it up the way it was folded. Golden muffler, hold them up. Okay. All right. Let the time start now. Oh no.
one muffler? Is that a car service? Is it a car service? Yes. Yeah. What are you looking under? Golden house, I'm looking for car service. Oh. Now I'm in the bees. <laughs> I guess I don't know the alphabet either. <laughs> you're, you're looking under carpet. I know, look. Cool. Okay. Cab shells and trucks. What are you What are you trying to do under car? What? Golden muffler. Is that a car? A car part? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Look under muffler. Okay. Um, so the classes that I took were how to have pricing conversations in a declining market, how to get quick price reductions, things like that. So, so I was able to tell a seller if we don't have two to three showings a week and every eight to ten showings we don't have an offer, we got to drop the price. And we were dropping it quickly to stay ahead of the market and those were the classes I was taking. And then I was taking short sale classes because we either had to adjust or there were realtors out there that were like, I'm not doing short sales. Well, cool, glad you can afford to not do short sales, but I do this to make a living, so I had to figure out how to do short sales. Now, I hired somebody to do the negotiations, but I figured out how to do short sales, and because of that, I was able to help buyers get short sales as well. And then there was the bank owned era, right? And those bank owned agents who were number one in the valley, well, they are not anymore. They did not adjust. And so I have just learned as a real estate agent, here I am all these years later, and there's disruptors out there. And I'm not even worried about it because I have a coach, Brian Buffini says, if the question to the if the answer to the question is yes, then it can't be disrupted. And the first question is, is it a high price item? So we're selling real estate, right? Is it high? Yes. 
is there risk involved? He made a slide for every question, which so I'm just going to go through. Uh, is there risk involved? Yes. yes. Is it an infrequent purchase? Yeah. Is it a complex transaction? Is it a unique purchase? So do we really need to worry about it, us going away? We just need to adjust, right? So one thing that I would recommend if you're an individual agent is to find somebody who, who has investors or, or an agent who invests because when you do go on a listing appointment and they are considering selling their house to open door or offer pad, you need to understand, um, well, you need to offer, hey, I'll buy your house. Don't sell it to them, I'll buy your house. Right? I mean, we're in real estate. We should be investing too. And if someone's going to sell their house for 280 and it's worth 350, wouldn't you want to get in that game? So I suggest, and I did this, is get an offer pad in a Zillow house on the house you live in, so that you can see what their fees are because they do change, right? Um, so that you know when you go on your listing appointments. All right, well, offer pad charges seven percent on top of the lower offer. So this is your net. And if you let me sell it, this is what's going on the market and this is what I can get you. And we are having to sell our way into the listing a little bit on those lower price homes, but we can do it, right? We just need to sharpen our sales skills and know what to say and, um, and stay in the game. So that's the last slide. What skills do you need to work on? And hopefully we gave you enough information today that you know what to say when someone says, are we in a bubble? And my buyer asked me that last Saturday because in her portal, the houses are going faster than she can get to them. And she's an engineer, so she's very analytical. And I had to explain to her, we're not in a bubble. This is what happened last time. This is what they were, they were giving stated loan, you know, stated loans. And I explained the whole thing to her and she's like, okay, okay. So this weekend, I'm gonna to talk to her about going out and looking at AWC houses and let's see if we can write a backup offer or something like that. But know what skills you need to work on. We did it. It's new. Yeah, it's new. Oh my gosh. Bam! Yeah. Yeah. It's new. We, we can answer some questions if you have questions, yeah. but we also have lunch out there and in the mastermind here in just a little bit too. Mm -hmm. That mastermind was more facilitation, right? So you guys will be talking and we'll find out what your struggles are and we can all share and learn from each other. I kudos to you all for being here. I want to thank you guys for coming in and hopefully we hit the answers to some of the questions we should some way yeah. Alright, thanks folks. Thanks you guys. Um, the book. I'm listening to so you know when you listen to a book you don't see the cover every time so it's like oh what's that book called the simple path to wealth have you read that one sorry no 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 simple yes path.